to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. It's always such a pleasure. We come to chapter 3 in the great book of Revelation. Revelation being in the Greek apocalypse uh, means to uncover, to make known. It doesn't mean what is normally shown in de or depicted as all heck breaking loose on earth. When God's ready, he'll take care of the enemy, but he loves his loved ones. He won't touch them. Why? Because he's, he doesn't have, he's, he protects us rather than that. But always remember, there's one, there's one thing about the book of Revelation. You've got to remember chapter 1, verse 10, or it'll kind of fly away from you. Chapter 1, verse 10 states that John was taken to the Lord's day. And then Second Peter would tell you, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day with the Lord is a thousand years with man. That's a millennium. So he was taken to the millennium. That's the first day of the millennium. And he was showing things that would happen before the millennium, that's now, and just after. So if, if you remember that, a lot of people think he meant Saturday or Sunday, whichever day you worship, he was taken. Uh-uh. You would lose the whole thing. Your, your time, all your time, time sequences would fly out the window. So always bear that in mind. Now we're studying the seven churches, which are the seven candlesticks that he, Christ was holding. Christ holds the churches in his hand. Uh, many of them he's very disappointed with. Now you might say, well, how would I know to pick one? Doesn't it make common sense to pick the pick the one that he's happy with, that he's happy with what they're teaching, because that's what's important. He gives you two shots at it, because there's two out of the seven, and two only, that teach what he wishes to be taught. If you want to receive his blessings, you will be in a church that teaches what uh, Smyrna and Philadelphia, which we'll be getting to today. Teach. Chapter 3, verse 1. Let's go with it. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars, that's the seven angels that come to the churches, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and are dead. You, you have a name, but you are spiritually dead deader than a hammer. Uh, this place was a place pretty well of commerce. And anytime you have a lot of commerce, uh, it, it's pretty difficult to, you're going to get sidetracked into all sorts of blind trails and other religions and perversion and what have you, which will turn God against the church quicker than anything. Verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Even, even the good that you have is ready to be spiritually dead. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. But you sure wouldn't want to join that church. Uh, I mean, sit there and teach you things that are not perfect before God, that God's against. That's really just kind of common sense. That's why a child can understand this. And even though it upsets some people for me to say that, because they've listened to man too long saying, you're not supposed to learn uh, or understand the book of Revelation, especially when you're going to be gone. Um, so um, then, uh, and there you have it. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 3. Remember, therefore, how 
thou hast received and heard uh, that, and uh, hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come unto you. You know what hour that is? It's the hour of temptation. It's the hour when Antichrist is here, and if he can bite you, he's going to do it. By that I mean persuade you uh, spiritually to follow him. Why will Christ come as a thief most, for most people? Because most people will already thought he was here with the instead of Christ. When the true Christ comes, they're going to be found worshiping the false one. Why? Because the false one's message is, I've come to fly you out of here. Boy, are they ready for it. Even though it's not biblical. That's, that's, that, so they are caught totally by surprise because they've already been had. They've already been deceived. That's why that if you're serving a dead message, you're, you're just about dead yourself. If you're not real, real watchful, if, if you don't repent and get back into God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse and learn what God has to say, not some man. You don't listen to this man or any other man without checking them out in this Word. Okay, then we go with verse 4. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. God's elect are always there, and they'll withstand anything Satan throws at them. And naturally, you're, as you'll find out in this book of Revelations, especially when we get to chapter 19, that the very robes you wear, the white robes you wear in heaven, are, are fine linen woven together from your righteous acts. That is to say, that, that that you have done right weaves the linen, linen, otherwise you're going to be naked there. And kind of, that'd be a shame, wouldn't it? Verse 5, He that overcometh, the, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before uh, my father and before his angels. You know, do, do you know what blotting out means? Blotting out means to, uh, he, he erased, it doesn't do you any good to have your letter in a church building. Your true letter is in heaven in the book of life. And I guarantee you there's no fudging in it. It's what it is. But those that don't make it he literally means blots out. They will be lost from memory. For, for uh, anyone that might uh, feel they would hate to see a loved one go to hell, you won't even remember them. Why? They're blotted out. Uh, well, what does blotted out mean? Now, come on. A child can understand blotted out. It's gone. It doesn't exist. And, and so it is. And our Father, he, he loves his children. And when you, when you follow his way, you're on the right path. And he has your name. I will confess his name before my Father. Christ will stand up for you right before God himself. How beautiful that is. Uh, there is a lot said in that verse as to what hell actually is. God, the consuming fire, can speak and something can become everything, or he can speak and something can become nothing. I mean, gone, brought it out. So what you want to worry about is your letter in heaven, that right in our Father's hand, because that's what you're judged by. Verse 6, he that hath an ear let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You know, it's kind of sad. We've, we've covered that statement several times. In, in the Greek, it is so much stronger. 
It says, you that have ears to hear and with understanding, you that have eyes to see can see with understanding. There's a great difference. You could hear sound. And it may even mean nothing to you. But he said, blessed are you that can hear this word. And it means something to you as well. Because you have ears to hear. You have eyes to see. And that's why he makes that statement. But it's really not as clear as it should be in the English. But to hear and yet at the same time understand perfectly what you're hearing. That's, he said, that's, you're, you're blessed. And, he, and he's going to bless it. You can rest assured. Uh, verse 7. And, to, and, and here we, we drop, sorry, uh, you sure wouldn't want to be a member of that church. Now, we're coming to the sixth out of the seven, I believe it is. And it's a church named Philadelphia, which means being interpreted brotherly love, which brotherly love has, it's a good thing, but it doesn't have anything to do with why God chose the church. It's what they're teaching. So listen to it carefully. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, and he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. If you have that key to David, his genealogy from which Christ came, or the genealogy through Cain, which the Kenite came. And God has made that clear coming out the gate all the way in the scriptures about the, the uh, key, that key. And the truth is that key. It, it opens doors that no man can close them on you. Once you have that truth, you're not going to give it up for anything. Um, it's, um, uh, I, I know in the past we've had many people say, uh, I'm going to try to get a pastor to drag the people away from that shepherd's chapel. That they said, you, you can't do it. They're not going to, they, they won't leave that ministry because it's, te it's of what they teach. And, and this is true. That key opens doors, and nobody's going to shut that on you. You won't allow it? Fine. Because you, you see the simplicity in which Christ teaches rather than the confusion that man would pass around. The traditions of man make void the Word of God, and God's Word is always very clear. Once you have ears to hear with understanding, Verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. You, you, I open that door real wide. You can see the truth with understanding. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Always stick with the truth. God will always protect you for it. He will always bless you for it. But... <clears throat> That's what the truth will do for you. <clears throat> it opens the door to the truth, whereby you have that guarantee of that walk with him and he with you and his blessings in your life. Verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, here comes the Kenites again, which say they are Jews. They claim to be of our brother Judah, and they're lying. They cause a great deal of trouble for our brother Judah, and are not. But do, his, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. This, this may be a little bit difficult to understand. Why would they worship before your feet? <clears throat> well, if you're a student of the Word, you know that all of God's elect are gathered immediately around the throne, around Christ's feet. So it's not you that they're bowing to, it is to Christ. Every knee on the first day of the millennium, which takes us back to chapter 1, verse 
10, every knee shall bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care if it's Kenite or who, because they realize they've been had. Unfortunately for some, it'll be a little bit too late. Uh, how could it be that there is so much confusion about how what consummates the end of this age when God has promised, I've opened the door. You can see it. You can understand it. Because he sent Paul and many other excellent teachers. Naturally, God doing the teaching and, uh, and Paul passing it on. I, I'm going to show you how simple it is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where people get the flyaway bug. They don't, they're ignorant of the fact that it, that trump that's spoken of there doesn't happen. That's the seventh trump. The farthest one out. If you can count from one to seven, seven's it. Okay. But, but they don't consider what happened in the sixth trump when the Antichrist came. They just ride right over that, leave that part out of their beliefs, and unfortunately, that's when the stinger is here. And boy, will you get stung if you're not careful. But I, I, I want you to see how simple that our Father makes it for us. Chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now, now what's complicated about that? I want to talk to you about Christ returning to this earth and we gaining, g gathering back to him. I, I want to tell you how it's going to be so you won't be deceived. And he's even going to tell us who the deceiver is. So that, that you, can, you can cut that in any language or however you want to as long as it's properly translated. It means this is how we gather back to the true Christ, okay? Not the fake, the true Christ. Verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. Don't let the First Thessalonians throw you, the flyaway bug, don't get it as that the day of Christ is at hand. It doesn't, it doesn't happen at the sixth trump. It happens at the seventh. It's over, okay? Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. Whatever he wants to use, don't let him deceive you because it would be Satan talking to him. For that day shall not come. I repeat, not come except there come a falling away first. That's the great apostasy, the change, uh, changing minds. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. <clears throat> a lot of people in ignorance think that Jude was the son of perdition. That's not true. Perdition means apollos, which means apollyon, which that's one of Satan's names. I believe it's 622 in your Strong's Concordance that it's one of his names, it is Satan, because what does perdition mean? He's, he's already pronounced dead. There is no individual named. We know fallen angels are doomed, but Satan is the only individual that has already been promised death. He has already had his judgment. You want to read it for yourself? It's real easy. Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19. He says, I'm going to turn you to ashes from within, talking to Satan. So that, that hasn't, that's the only son of perdition we have. You don't have any choice. So he's talking about the Antichrist. He's talking about Satan. Satan plays many roles. Oftentimes roles are taken away from him, but not his name and not his actions until the great white throne judgment. So, uh, let no man deceive you and have you worshiping Satan instead of the true Christ. 
that, that's a terrible price to pay for ignorance when he sent you a letter. And, and a child, I'm going to say it again, a child can understand this. It's how we get back together with Christ. When do we meet him? Well, let's find out. But first, first before that happens, Satan's got to be cast out on the earth. In the 12th chapter, in verses 6 and 7, you'll read it in detail. Verse 4, what does he do? Who opposeth and exalteth himself. He is something on a stick. Above all that is called God. Right? He claims to be God. He claims to be Christ, Emmanuel, with us. Or that is worship so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He takes Jerusalem, claiming to be God himself through the Son, and sits right there in the holy place. Verse 5, Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. We talked about it. Went into detail. Don't forget it. Don't let it slide. You see, that is so very simple. Verse 6, And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Lord, you, you know now exactly how he's, the, 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 current, the events and the chronology that brings him into the presence. Verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The Kenites are already with us. Who, who, does the, who, is, who goes to his children? He goes to his own children first. The Kenite. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. You have a lot of Bible thumpers that will come along and say, well, that's the church. The church has got to be taken away first before the false one can be revealed. There's, the church has no article. The church is not the subject. I mean, a child can tell you the church isn't mentioned from verse 1 of this chapter 2 all the way through to this point. So you have to go to the Greek and you realize the verb here. Who let it? Um, is a transitive verb. Well, explain a transitive verb for me in the Greek. Well, it means that the power or to, to understand who's being talked about, you have to transfer back to the verb four and five, that's a sign of perdition is coming. Th that's locked in. Okay. So it, it wouldn't be any great step for you to know that. And you with Strong's Concordances, if I'm not mistaken, I'm sorry, uh, Companion Bibles, it breaks that right out for you and explains it in detail. The, the transitive verb, so that you're not led astray. So, uh, well, how then is, can that be? Revelation makes it very clear. Michael is the one that holds him. Michael and our Heavenly Father are the ones that allow him to, and all of his angels, on the third world trump to be kicked out on earth pretty soon. And therefore, it is our Heavenly Father himself who led us until he decides to take him out of the way, and he's getting the boot. And Michael and his angels, they have quite a war up there. But then, then it says, everybody rejoices in heaven while he's gone. But he's right here in the middle of earth. Well, what's he doing? He's sitting in God's temple claiming to be God. And that's what he deceives people. That is not difficult to understand or to accept. You would really have to be blind to not follow that subject through and to pick up on that verb. Um, verse 8 as we continue. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Well, who's the wicked one? Apollyon, son of perdition, Satan, Antichrist, instead of Christ, Lucifer, small horn, 
by whatever name you wish to call him, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. In other words, that role is gone for him. He'll never have it again. Verse 9, this is what happens to those that are deceived by him. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. It's written in the 13th chapter of this great book of Revelation that he can snap his fingers and lightning come from heaven. What do you think that's going to do to some churches? They're going to be awed by it. Why? Well, they, they haven't read the 13th chapter of Revelation to find out. They don't know that's going to happen. You do, because we're going to go there after a while, and when we get to that third verse, you're going to find out. Verse 10, what does he do? And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. They just let it slip away. Why? Well, they've listened to man. You don't have to understand this book. You're going to be gone. And unfortunately, that's not what this chapter says. It says, Christ will not return to us until after the false Christ comes first. You want to really get that melted down in your mind. That's the door God opens for you and let you see into, whereby you're not deceived. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. Do you understand that? If they want to be deceived, God will help them out. Our Father is jealous. He is the creator of our very being, and he expects us to love him. You don't love him, he, he, he will assist you in the deception whereby you get led astray. Why? Because it's lazy and it's easy to say, this is my security blanket. I get to fly away. And unfortunately, you're not going anywhere. If you believe that, that's the Antichrist message, I'm going to fly you away. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's pretty plain, isn't it? That's God with his own children that want to believe a lie. He'll help them out. 13, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved brethren of the Lord, because God from, hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. God's elect are set aside. And that, that's exactly what that means. 14, whereunto he called you by his gospel. The truth will bring you out if you'll listen to it. To the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the glory is. It's to be a soldier for Almighty God. Stand, making that stand. 15, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, neither, uh, whether by word or by epistle. You've got to stand for something or you stand for nothing. And, and a person that stands for nothing, is just, they're worthless. No good as far as God's service is concerned. Verse 16, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, the full God is, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, 17, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, uh, word and work. Work is very important to our Father. It's got to be the right work. The work is believing. And when God gives you a truth to help other people even understand it, whereby they are not taken down that trip of Primrose Lane with the deceiver. Because anyone can tell in this chapter, there's many other places 
but especially in this chapter, that the false one comes first. All the Gospels, except one, well, all of them, come to think about it, will tell you that the false Christ comes first before the true Christ. How, how can people be so deceived to think they're going to be gone over one little phrase where they don't even understand the trumps of which one is sounding and what the time sequence is? All right, and returning then to the third chapter of the great book of Revelation, let's go with the 10th verse. The 10th verse reads, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Satan's not going to tempt you. You're going to know who he is. There'll be no. T you, we find him to be an abomination, not tempting, which shall come upon all the world. But how, how much of the world was that? all the world. And if you, if, you, if you have any wisdom at all and look around you, you can understand why. To try them that dwell upon the earth. God wants to know who loves him. He's choosing his children for the eternity, or I should say, the children themselves choose which path they will go. 11, behold, I come quickly. This is from that first day of the millennium. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Don't let some deceiving, lying, so-called prophet rip it right away from you with deception. Twelve, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of the heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. That's Hezbollah, and the land is Beulah. It means I love you and we're married. That's the, the married land with Father taking that great wedding, uh, possession, and, and um, concluding the very ministry itself into a wonderful eternity. You know, there's something more beautiful about that if you're not careful. You need, when we get to 21, you'll find out what that temple is. It doesn't have one. How could you be a pillar in a temple that doesn't exist? Spiritually, it exists. It has no temple because the Father and the Son are the temple thereof, and you help hold them up. Could you stand for them? You're with them, and they appreciate you. They love you, and they will always take care of you. When you make that stand against a world that is diseased with false teaching, and you'll be a very happy person for it. Doesn't mean there won't be any bumps. But hey, when, when the plowing gets too rough, that's just the way we like it. Because we're children of the living God. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 
1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. We can no longer answer all questions because we go into millions of homes. And thank God for that, that, that the gospel goes forth in many places. And, uh, but especially right here, we try to see that it comes chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and it is God's word that is taught. That's, that's what's important. So if you have a question, let the spirit move and ask it. Uh, and and how, how precious it is to have an opportunity to serve the living God. Not, not a dead one, and not one that'll take you spiritually dead somewhere, but the true word of God, our heavenly Father. He always simplifies. You know, if you th God is not the author of confusion, but of common sense, of peace, of understanding. And that understanding will always see you through. Let's go to his throne. Heavenly Father, watch over these that need a touch. In your precious name, amen, amen. Okay, and we get into some question time here. And we'll start with Pam from California. When Moses was leading the children to the promised land, were there some Kenites there among them? They always are. That's, that, that's, they, all, they are um, leeches, and they have to latch on like a leech to live. And, and um, by taking away from people, not adding to. Dolores from Texas. The Bible says you can drink wine for the stomach. In the other parts, it says don't drink whiskey. Please explain. Well, it says don't drink strong drink. Uh, wine can be a strong drink if you drink a gallon. Let's quote the scripture properly. Take a little wine for the good of your tummy. In other words, a good wine is very healing and settling at night. If you're in business and you're upset, don't start popping pills. A pill popper is going nowhere. They cannot stand up to the heat, and they'll, they'll fall. But a, a little good wine, a little now, okay, not a gallon. A gallon makes it strong drink. In other words, most things are, are the, uh, except scavengers, are in moderation, are fine. Uh, like wine is fine in moderation, little. But if you overdo anything, you become a drunkard. Uh, and nobody's going to listen to a drunkard. Nobody's going to listen to a pill popper. Why would they want to? They don't make sense. They always let those little things slip in the side where a person that's away from that kind of stuff can spot it that quick. So if you want to really be a servant of God, that's how you serve. Maggie from Tennessee, if the devil is locked up in heaven by Michael, but his spirit is down on earth, he is... He is harming the spirit. How can, how can he harm anyone while he is locked up? Well, his spirit isn't locked up. You know, uh, everyone has a spirit. You have a spirit. Uh, I take my spirit and I try to teach with it to help people. Not to make some name for myself, but to help people understand the letter that our Father has sent to them. Uh, so your spirit can be cast out on people. So Satan, he's supernatural. You're not talking about a flesh man or woman here. You're talking about a supernatural. You see, God, for every good, there's a negative. For the good, which is the Holy Spirit that God sends, should be your choice. Because if you have the Holy Spirit, 
And you don't have to worry about that wicked spirit because that Holy Spirit gives you power. You have a little strength, a little strength with the Holy Spirit helping you as a ton. Okay, You don't have anything to worry about. He'll, he'll take care of it. But don't worry. The evil spirit of Satan can do a lot of harm right here on earth if a Christian lets them. Okay? The thing is, you don't want to let them. You have power over them. Kathy from Virginia, I'm a beginning Christian. I have really enjoyed your teaching. I'm all alone in this world. I know our uh, flesh turns to dust when I die. What kind of form are we going to take after death? Uh, uh, every angel that has ever appeared, an angel simply, the word means messenger. Angel means messenger. They're always young and in the prime of life, and they stay that way for an eternity. Why? Because age has nothing to do with the spiritual body. So everyone basically, we, have, we do have gender, gender um, uh, allowances in the third earth age, whereby... Uh, and we're all married to all our Heavenly Father. He sees to that. But um, uh, other than that, that, we all look the same as we did as a very young, healthy person. Uh, Sally from North Carolina. There will be no missing limbs, no disease, because a spiritual body is not subject or subjectable to, uh, to be perishable. It lasts forever. Sally from North Carolina. I know B.C. means before Christ, but what does A.D. mean? It, 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 is, it is a Latin word meaning Anna Domine, which is to say the year of our Lord. And that's what you're saying when you say A.D. This would be 2014 A.D. Anna Domine, which is to say the year of our Lord. That means time started counting after he appeared and was born on this earth. Uh, and this would be Fred from Arkansas. I, I hope I hope uh, they got your I hope I got your name right. I've watched your program many times. But just the other day someone wrote and asked, Does your loved ones have that have gone to see you, can they go on and see me or you down here? And if so, uh, if so, can we speak to them and can they hear us? I, I you know, I, I wouldn't want to make a religion out of that. It, it doesn't hurt to pray to and for the ones that have gone on and to pass the thought of love. That's, it doesn't hurt anything to say, I miss you and I love you. That's fine, but they're not going to probably speak back to you. Your answer was yes, if I heard you right. If I am not out of context, I think that the Bible says, Thessalonians 4.14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. As in Luke 8.22, all wept and bewailed her, but she... Wept not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. Now, I can't remember just where this was. Please tell me, am I out of contact? Well, if you think, <coughs> excuse me, if you think that, that um, the people, why, why does Christ bring them with them? Because they're very much with him. Have you ever, have you ever read Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes is a great book that tells you how, as a flesh person, to be happy under the circumstances of this earth age. And in chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, it lets you know that when the silver cord parts, you die instantly. You're going to go to heaven from the Father from which you came. Your spirit is the intellect of your soul, your thought process, 
that is there. Now, what throws many people is Ecclesiastes is written to the man that walks under the sun, meaning the flesh body. And in chapter 9, it tells you what the flesh body knows. It doesn't know anything. It goes back in the ground. It goes back to dust. And nobody's going to remember it, or it's not going to remember anything. Why? It came from dust, and to dust it will return. It's not your real body. Your real body is your spiritual body. That's the way God created you. That's the way he formed you in the beginning, and that's the way you will be at the end. Uh, Sue from Oregon. I've always wondered why we will be judged later when God has already forgiven our sins. Why would we stand in judgment? Thank you for, um, for blessings. Judgment is not only for bad things. And don't ever, ever let somebody tell you that if Christ has forgiven you for something, it'll be brought up on Judgment Day because it's erased, blotted out of the Book of Life, which is your record in heaven. Now, initially, if it's blotted out, it's not there. It doesn't exist. And in more scriptures than one, God has said, once I forgive it, I don't want to hear about it again. End of story. I mean, that's it. So don't don't let some Bible plumper try to tell you that you're going to answer for all your sins on judgment. That's when you get your rewards also. And whatever sins you've got, uh, uh, righteous acts covers a multitude of sins. It pleases our Father, and he will always assist you and help you. Okay, Lisa from Kentucky. I was wondering about the very man and every every man in every city that God told Jeremiah that he had destroyed before. I know we were all here in spiritual bodies at the time of the dinosaur until Satan's overthrow, but I was thinking that perhaps God had more made flesh people before. No, uh uh. The dinosaur, and now there were no flesh people then. Uh, and we roamed the earth until Satan's overthrow. No, nope. we were not in flesh. This is the first earth age. And, and this, wh what was God doing in Jeremiah chapter 4? What he was doing when he said he destroyed, because of Satan's rebellion, I mean a third a third of the children God had ever created up to that time, and that was all of them. We all existed with him at that time, uh, had followed Satan. Satan was taken over, just like he is today. And uh, God went ahead then. He destroyed every city completely, every tree, every vegetable. A lot of people think that's talking about the flood of Noah. No way. Noah sent forth a dove and, and, and brought, he brought back an olive branch. Do you know how long it takes an olive tree to grow from a little seed if God destroyed them all right up to a branch? Quite, quite a while. It won't be a dove's flight off somewhere. In other words, he didn't totally destroy the earth at the flood of Noah, but he did it in that kakabo. It's the Greek word, which means the overthrow. Uh, Caroline from Oregon, Pastor Dennis Murray. This is Caroline from Oregon. Please, call, can you tell me if you have to face east to pray? I pray a lot, and I don't want my love and questions and thankfulness not to reach him. You can pray upside down, inside out. Uh, uh, east, west, north, south, it, it doesn't matter, God hears you. Those are traditions of men. And when you're driving, whichever direction you're driving, if you have time and you want to thank Father for something, go to it. I don't care if you're headed north. 
You see, you're immune to a, a, a lot of the no-nos and traditions of men. Because God loves you, he hears you wherever you are. Uh, Maggie from Florida, I really enjoy studying with you, your ministry, and learning Father's Word. I would like to thank you, Dennis, and all the staff, and and all you do, and a big thank you to our Father in, from for opening my eyes and ears to the truth. And close, well, thank you, that's good. Um, since all souls must be born in this earth age, will anyone still be able to uh, die after Antichrist comes? Yeah, for sure. As long as we're, up until the seventh trump, as long as we're in flesh bodies, somebody can die. Uh, but God's putting an army together in heaven that he's going to bring with him. Remember a while ago he said it's going to bring them with him when he comes. They're warriors. Um, Lynn from Michigan. Is the lake of fire just death, or is it living in hell with Satan for an eternity? We have a God of love. I, I know a lot of people want, they think, oh, it's such a tough job living to be a Christian. I want to see them suffer. What kind of heaven would that be? What kind of mind would you have? God intends to blot them out. God is a consuming fire. I, I, have, I have a work called cons the um, Hellfire and God the Consuming Fire. Uh, you might enjoy it. Um, okay, this would be Brian. Is that what that is, I think, from Kentucky? Uh, it might be Bryn. I've been watching 10 years, bless both you and your staff. How is, how is Mr. Arnold Murray doing? Right in there. We have mailed this question three times, hope to get an answer on air. Here we go. Since Job is the oldest book, what years did um, he live and what years did he go through his own tribulation and trials. Um, it's strange, I think you got this answered twice, because I answered this yesterday, I think. He, he was, he was uh, in his prime about 1635 B.C. And uh, while he lived, um, uh, Moses uh, came into his ministry. And um, it, so it was after, but they did uh, coexist at the same time. By that, I don't mean necessarily they were friends, but it's a time period, chronologically. Bernie from Virginia, if there was no female before the catabo, when did God foreknow them? They, we were all the same. I, I feel like he picked the toughest to be woman. Because, you know, if man had to go through what woman goes through, childbirth, man likes to think he had a hard time through childbirth. But, uh, of course, I've never, never experienced it, but I know it's very painful. Uh, and most men would, they couldn't handle it. Okay. So I, I know he picked the toughest and yet the prettiest and absolutely the very best to be females. And they, but they certainly coexisted in the first earth age where there was no gender um, necessarily. And we got Andy from, from where? Arizona. When, uh, when Jesus was lost for three days, when he was 12 years old, they found him in the temple listening and asking questions. I was wondering how much information we have on his youth and how old was he um, uh, when he performed his first miracle that is listed in the Bible. Um, I'm 94 years old and will aid 
Well, thank you. We appreciate having you with us. Uh, let, let, let me correct your quote just a little bit. Christ, Christ wasn't asking questions. He was answering questions. And this was to the scholars, the best scholars of that time. And they were blown away because this 12-year-old lad could answer whatever question they put to him. They were amazed, but they didn't know. They had the Word of God himself walking among them. And that's why they were amazed. But um, we, the traditions of Glastonbury, we have a little book in our library that tell of Joseph of Arimathea, his uncle, how that he had uh, ten mines in Glastonbury, England. And even to this day in England, they have these uh, signs of um, a ship with a man in the back and a little boy in front, which is believed, uh, they think it's is Christ and Joseph of Arimathea. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. You really do. But most of all, God loves you for it because it's a love letter he sent to you for you to have understanding so no one could deceive you. You make his day, boy, does he make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? You bless God, he will always bless you. Most important, you stay in his word. Every day, and his word is a good day. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800 643 4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. book of Mark. Mark, one of the apostles, Mark having been a very young lad at the time Christ walked this earth, was always in the shadows observing and listening with the intensity that young ears can, picking up every word. And this great gospel moves very fast. But what a, what a interesting and certainly impressive gospel it is for Mark from those that young mind reiterates to you in chapter 13 how some are going to be delivered up, exactly what they are supposed to do, and even in that 13th chapter giving you the seven events that fulfill this or make up the seven seals and the seven trumpets and telling you how you are to react to them. A fast-moving gospel, one that I know you'll enjoy.
Rapid, Arkansas. This is with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. Okay, good day to you. God bless you. We've been waiting on you to get right into the Word. We're just going to kind of visit along a little bit. We're going to talk about your destiny, a subject that interests everyone, for you cannot help but wonder, what does the Bible mean to me? What, do, what is my place in it? Probably better said. We're going to address that a little bit. As Christians, some of the finer points, perhaps, yet very basic, 